Hello friends, welcome back. Uh, today's lecture is all about psychoanalysis. Um, it's kind of a big theory, there's a lot to it, so I'm going to split it up over a couple of videos just to cover all of the material. Uh, but this will be the new pair of glasses that we will be wearing in order to read our next book, uh, Come Closer by Sarah Gran. Um, if you've taken a look at it so far, uh, you can see it's pretty easy read. I don't think you're going to struggle with this one. And uh, it tells a really, really, really good story. So I, I think you'll like it. I, I hope you'll like it. Before we get into this, though, I wanted to explain to you um, your essay instructions just so you understand how you're going to be reading this. Uh, there's a very specific way I'd like you to read this story. This story is told in first person, and so that means our main character, Amanda, is speaking directly to you. She's talking to you, she's telling you her story, she's telling you her truth. She's not lying to you, she believes that the events in this book really happened. Now, Amanda believes that her apartment is haunted. And even worse, she comes to believe that whatever the spirit is that's haunting her apartment is trying to get into her. It's trying to possess her. On its surface, it's a really simple little ghost story, and she seems really easy to believe at first. She's going to give you some evidence and some examples that are, are pretty hard to argue against. But I want you to read this the way a psychiatrist would read this. So listen to her the way a therapist might. So, yeah, she believes her house is haunted, and she does believe that she's being possessed by whatever this thing is. But as a psychiatrist, you need to be asking yourself, why? Why would she believe this? And why does she want other people to believe this story, too? Basically, what's in it for her? Um, so be very cautious. I know it's easy to believe her story, and you're going you're gonna to want to trust what she has to say. Um, but in one of our later videos, I will show you why we can almost virtually rule out everything she has told us as, as not the truth. Um, so read this the way a psychiatrist is. What is it do you think she wants? What is it she's after? And why is she doing it this, this way, maybe? Um, and I think our little conversations and our book talks will kind of help you um, kind of help point you in the right direction, so you should be able to analyze her or some other characters in the book uh, pretty easily. In order to do that, we have to understand what psychoanalysis is. If you've ever seen any TV show or movie where a character goes to see a psychiatrist, they're usually laying on a couch, right, and they're, they're talking about their problems, and the psychiatrist is encouraging uh, his or her patient to speak openly and honestly and without any filters, just you know, let it all out. Um, and that was developed by a Victorian gentleman, this is from the 1800s, uh, named Sigmund Freud. Even if you haven't studied him too closely, I'm, I'm pretty sure you've probably heard of his name. Um, and Freud is sort of the inventor of what we now use today called talk therapy. Psychoanalytical criticism is actually pretty easy to sort of easily sum up. First, most of who we are as individuals has been shaped by our childhoods. And so experiences we had that were positive sort of taught us to reach for more positive and rewarding experiences. Um, and the flip side of that, of course, is that negative experiences have taught us to avoid those as much as possible. We don't like when bad things happen. How do we make sure that those things don't happen to us again? Uh, an example of that would be um, a child who grows up severely, maybe physically abused. Um, studies show more often than not that those children then grow up to abuse their children as well because that's the behavior that was modeled for them. That's all that they knew. And so they continue that vicious cycle of abuse. Now, other children might grow up and say, you know, I hated what was done to me and I'm gonna do the complete opposite of that. Um, so that can also have a really positive impact on a child's life that they decide that they are going to raise their child in a positive and loving environment different from what they knew. So it becomes sort of a learning experience for them both. Secondly, Sigmund Freud argued that the um, fears and the desires and the little guilts that we walk around with all our lives um, also contribute to who we are, but a really important thing he said about that is we can control that. If we can identify those things inside of us, the things that scare us, the things that we want, the things that make us feel bad, then we can begin to change our behavior as we 
react to those things. Now, as, as you can imagine, for its time, back in the 1800s, these were some really revolutionary ideas that Freud was telling people, be open, be honest, and talk about your feelings. Now, a lot of what Sigmund Freud did back in his time has not aged well, and there are some really, there were some really bad ideas in, in his theories, and we're going to talk about those in another video. Um, but a lot of what he did has found a happy home here in the English department, where we can use some of these ideas to try and make sense of our characters in stories. Why are they doing what they're doing, and what are they getting out of it? One of the most important concepts that Sigmund Freud came up with is this idea of emotional defenses. This is sort of, you know, the armor that we put on in order to protect ourselves from things that threaten us in our everyday lives. Um, and these are ways that we try and, and ward off uncomfortable things or try and suppress and push down uncomfortable feelings um, and keep them buried deep down inside of us. Um, so let's take a look at some of the most common emotional defenses that we have, and you may recognize yourself in some of these as well. All right, there are a lot of defenses, but this kind of boils down to the, the, main, the main ones here. Um, and these are in the article that you read, but just to, to briefly understand what these are, uh, the first is denial, which obviously is when we refuse to accept something that's uncomfortable. Um, we just flat out deny that it ever happened, that it ever existed, because we don't want to confront it. We don't want to talk about it. Uh, the next one is selective perception, which means you see and hear what you want. Uh, the next one is selective memory, um, and you can probably guess that's when you remember what you want. You're able to block out the things that you don't want to think about. In denial, you straight out refuse that something ever happened, but avoidance is a little bit different. With avoidance, you know that there's something bad out there, but you're just choosing to stay away from it. Uh, maybe you have a really bad relationship with a sibling you don't get along with, so whenever they come over, you stay out of the room, maybe you even leave the house. Um, so you're just avoiding a problem that you know exists, but you just don't want to take the steps to really resolve it. Uh, the next one is displacement. Uh, I think we're all guilty of this one, and this is where we take it out on other people. Um, let's say you come home from work and your boss has been really mean to you. You just had a really bad day with your boss and you, you can't really say anything back to your boss because you need the job. So instead you go home and you start yelling at your mom or you yell at your boyfriend or girlfriend or spouse. Um, they did nothing wrong to you, but you need to let out that anger. And so when we displace our anger, when we displace our emotions, we put them onto other people. We kind of take it out on other people because we know those other people, like our parents or siblings or our significant others, they love us no matter what. They know that we're just frustrated and we need someone to talk to. Uh, the next one is projection. And this is where you blame others for maybe your misdeeds um, or your own faults. Uh, for example, I had a friend in high school whose boyfriend always accused her of cheating. And she was the most loyal and faithful girlfriend you could have ever had. Like, she never cheated. She never even thought of that. It never crossed her mind. But he kept accusing her of cheating, which really kind of tells us a couple things about the boyfriend and his projections. It probably means that he had cheated on her and just hadn't gotten caught yet. Or he's got cheating on his mind, and so he wants to blame other people so he doesn't feel so guilty about it. So projection is when we put our faults on other people. And finally, regression. This can be really dangerous. If people just really, really don't want to confront the hard things in life, they will regress or go back to a former time when they were really comfortable. Um, sometimes you might see this in grown-ups who suddenly act very childish. Um, sometimes uh, you've probably heard of a midlife crisis where people of a certain age, they reach a certain age, and they're really afraid about confronting their future and, and confronting the idea of aging. So maybe the guy will go out and buy a toupee so his hair looks better and he'll buy a new sports car to make him feel younger. Um, or maybe a woman decides to leave her comfortable marriage and find a much younger boyfriend. You know, there's all kinds of ways that people regress to a time when they felt younger or happier or, or just different. All right, if that list in blue is a list of our defenses, then the natural question is, what are we defending ourselves against? 
What causes our anxiety? What are those threats that we're facing in our real world? Well, the author of the article gives you a list of some of the most um, common, I guess, emotional fears and triggers that most of us, again, can probably relate to. Uh, the first is fear of intimacy, and this is where you're nervous or anxious about being close to other people. Um, maybe it's hard for you to show affection or show love um, or just be physically near others. Uh, fear of abandonment is the fear of being left alone. And not just, you know, left alone while your spouse goes to the grocery store. Um, this is a, a deep and troubling fear that the people you love most are going to leave you permanently. Uh, maybe you walk around with this sort of chronic fear that your parents are going to die or something. Um, so it's a lot more serious than just being left alone in the moment. It's something that's more long term. Uh, the next one is fear of betrayal, which is it is exactly what it sounds like. This is someone who's afraid constantly that people are going to betray them, um, that they're going to be hurt. And you can usually see this in people who go around hurting others because they would rather hurt others first before they are hurt. Um, so that's what fear of betrayal looks like in people. Uh, the next one down is low self-esteem. Um, and again, we've all had our bad days where we don't feel like we look our best, our hair looks funny, our clothes don't fit right, maybe we've gained a few extra pounds. Um, low self-esteem is much more devastating. It's much more crippling to the people who suffer from this. Um, and another way to think of it is someone who walks around constantly believing that they are totally undeserving of, and you can fill in the blank here, someone with low self-esteem feels that no one will ever love them because they don't deserve it or they don't deserve the career of their dreams, um, or they don't deserve to find a partner and settle down and be happy. Um, having low self-esteem stops you from forming personal relationships uh, with friends or with romantic partners or with coworkers or bosses. Um, so this, this can be a very, very painful uh, and chronic thing when you're suffering from low self-esteem because it really colors and ultimately sort of hurts the world that you're living in. Uh, the next one down is unstable self, and this is where someone doesn't quite know themselves just yet. Now, a lot of people in their early 20s, college students like you guys, you are sort of in this stage right now of unstable self, but that's good. When you're in your 20s, when you're in college, when you're kind of exploring life out on your own and, and gaining some of that independence that you've never had before, you're still discovering who you are, and you're still trying to kind of form your values and morals and figure out your positions on different um, topics. Some of you maybe are just starting to get into politics for the first time in your life, and you might even be discovering that ideas that you grew up with, you no longer agree with anymore. You're, you're becoming your own person. So to be unstable right now as a young person in your life, that is totally fine because you are still finding out who you are. The problem is if you get to be an older person, if you're in your 40s or, or probably later, 50s and 60s, and you still don't know who you are and what you're about, that can become a real problem because then you can't connect with other people or form really deep and meaningful relationships with other people. And finally, down on the bottom, it was kind of, <laughs> it was hard to write down there, um, eatable fixation. And we're going to talk more about that in another video. This is one of uh, Freud's more unpopular ideas, at least how it came to be is really kind of gross. Uh, but we'll talk about that. Basically what it means, it's hard to see down there at the bottom, eatable fixations are parent issues. So basically any problems you have um, could have stemmed from your relationship with your parents, uh, with your mom, your dad, any, any guardian in your life. Um, maybe it was the lack of guardianship, the lack of parents, but eatable fixation has to do with those issues caused by our parents. So these ideas here, according to Freud, are probably the biggest part of what sort of informs our decisions, what sort of drives our lives forward. But just as big and important a motivator are the things that we want and need. And there's a difference there. There are things that we need that help us sustain survival. And there's things that we want, the things that give us value, the things that we kind of fill our homes with for entertainment or for... Um, status to make us feel more important or look better than the neighbors. Um, but the things we want and need can be divided up into three levels. And these are the levels of consciousness, which has remained one of the biggest and most enduring ideas that Freud came up with. 
To start with, most of you have probably seen a photograph or a painting of an iceberg. What it looks like above the water and what it looks like below the waterline. And if you've seen these photos before, then obviously you know that <laughs> we only see a fraction of the iceberg. Only a little bit sticks up above the surface. Most of an iceberg you have to look underwater to find. Uh, Sigmund Freud said that our, our consciousness, our minds, sort of work the same way. Up above the waterline, we have our consciousness. Um, and this is the things that we are uh, aware of at any given moment. What we're doing right now, what we did yesterday, what we're going to be doing tomorrow. Um, these are the thoughts that you can sort of easily pull up from your um, memory storage. For example, even if I said, think of the funniest thing that happened to you when you were a little kid, like under the age of 10 years old. Well, it might take you a minute to think of it, but you can probably reach back and grab it. So even those things that we have to kind of slow down and think about, as long as you can bring it up to the surface, it's a part of your consciousness. Now, down below, underneath the waterline here, we have our unconscious. Now, obviously, there's a lot more down below than on top, and that's because the unconscious represents everything that we forgot we knew. Um, basically, every experience you have ever lived is stored down in your unconscious, like in filing cabinets. And so when a psychiatrist works with a patient, uh, what they're trying to do is dig down deep into some of those old files and bring up some of those unconscious thoughts and memories and experience, experiences that the patient has completely forgotten about because once you dig a little bit deeper, that might be able to answer some bigger, tougher questions that the patient had going in to see the psychiatrist. It can help both people understand why the patient does the things that they do. All right, so we can take our example of the iceberg and break it down into three more pieces, and these are the pieces of our consciousness. This is how these are broken down. Uh, at the very top, we have our super ego. This is our moral voice. This is sort of like uh, the little um, angel on our shoulder telling us to do the right thing all the time, be good, make good choices, be, be good out there. Um, you can kind of think of this as the voice of your parent. It's the one that tries to stop you from doing something bad or from doing something that could get you hurt or get arrested or whatever else. Um, so that's your moral voice at the very top that tells you, be good, behave yourself. Down on the bottom, is the id, I-D. Um, and this is your impulses, and this is your basic instincts. This is hunger, this is sleep, this is your um, drive for sex. Um, your id is basically all your childish impulses. When you throw a tantrum, and we still do this as grown-ups, when we get really angry and we fly off the handle and kind of act like a little kid, or if we act bratty or grumpy or whatever, that's our id at play. Those are our basic instincts, our basic animal drives kicking in. Uh, now right there in the middle is our ego, and this is sort of the referee, this is the balance that's trying to um, be nice to the superego and the id. So the ego is always trying to find ways to satisfy both of those things. Um, the ego also represents the public self, it's the face that you put out there to the public. Um, your ego is the personality that people get to know. It's <laughs> your ego is what controls your behaviors in public so you don't, you know, go to other people's tables in a restaurant and just start eating food off their plate like a dog. And it's also the part of you that tries not to, to be as judgmental as the super ego wants you to be because we're, we all make mistakes, none of us are perfect, and the ego knows that. So the ego represents the very best of you. Just so you can sort of picture what this looks like in, in real life, um, your brain is constantly fighting with itself um, to balance the good decisions and the bad decisions. So let's say right now you are very, very sleepy. You just want to, you just want to go to bed. Your super ego is going to tell you, no, you need to finish watching this video because it's your assignment, it's your project. You can go to sleep tonight and get a nice full eight hours of sleep. Um, your id is saying, no, I want to go to sleep, and I'm going to sleep right now. Your ego, there in the middle, has to try and satisfy both of these things. And so your ego might say, well, uh, if I'm too tired to finish the video, I'm going to shut it off now, take maybe a little 20-minute nap just to get re-energized, and then I'll finish it, I'll power through and get the rest of this video done, and maybe start some homework. 
Um, so your ego is looking for that best possible solution that will make everybody happy. So this is the last thing I wanted to show you today. Um, so what does psychoanalysis mean for literature? How do we use it here in an English class? Well, psychoanalytic theory examines these three areas. Um, so these are the three things we look for when we try and read as a psychologist. Um, we can look at the author. How does the story express the author's own wants or needs? Um, sometimes it shines uh, pretty clearly through their work. Um, other times we might be looking at the reader. You know, how do we as an audience respond emotionally to a story? Um, my mom suffered really horrible physical abuse when she was a little girl. And later in life, she read a book where the uh, hero, a little girl, was really badly abused. Well, she couldn't finish the book because it just hit a little bit too close to home. Um, it was just too emotionally charged for her, so she couldn't finish reading it. But for our purposes here, uh, when we read Come Closer, we're going to use the question listed down below uh, in red there. We're going to be looking at our characters. What does how they behave, speak, and think reveal about what they want or need. So we're going to be looking at the behaviors and the choices and everything our characters say and do and we're going to figure out what does that reveal about them and what they want or need. What are they trying to convince other people to believe and why? That's kind of the big question. Why are our characters, especially Amanda, doing the things that they are doing? On the back of your essay instructions, I gave you a T-chart that looks something like this. On an, and on one side, you, as you read, you can list uh, the behaviors of a character, the things they say or do. So that would be the facts from the story. On the other side of the T-chart would be your interpretation or your analysis of those behaviors. So this is an event from a book. And on this side would be your interpretation. What could it possibly mean about this character? Um, now, obviously, what real psychiatrists and psychologists do is much more complicated than this. But for our English class, and for the purpose of reading this book and writing an essay about it, I think this will work really well. So I wanted to give you the T-chart just so you have a place to kind of keep notes and keep everything all together. Uh, so just to show you an example of what this looks like, how this would work. Let's just say, for an example, I'm reading a book about a character. A uh, character has trouble forming relationships with other older characters following the deaths of his parents. Uh, so he's lost his parents, and throughout the rest of the book, he's really finding it difficult to make a worthwhile and strong connection with other characters who are older, who maybe represent sort of parent figures to him. Right? So that's the fact. That came from the book my interpretation might look like something like this. Um, so I would maybe say that he's got Oedipal or parent issues, right? Um, we can say this stems from a fear of abandonment. It's not that his parents just went away on a trip. He's lost them forever. And so that is going to shape and color his future relationships. Um, I can also say here that he is suffering from avoidance. Um, he doesn't want to get close to people who are sort of reminders of his parents, and so he's avoiding those kinds of friendships and relationships altogether. We can even add, you know, fear of intimacy. He doesn't want to get close to people uh, because he's afraid that they might also abandon him. All right, friends, that does it for today. I just wanted to give you sort of a quick overview of the most important parts of psychoanalysis and also wanted to touch base on our essay and what the expectations are from you. Um, as far as what you'll be looking for as you read. Again, it's a ghost story, but I'm asking you to do something sort of unusual. Forget about the ghosts. So if we take the supernatural part out of it, then what is Amanda really trying to tell us? What does she want? And why is she using the ghost story to go about getting it? Um, so be mindful of those things when you are reading the story. Um, in future videos, we will lay out some more of what psychoanalysis looks like. Um, obviously, in our book talks, we will start connecting these ideas to our characters. So even if this seems overwhelming right now, um, just like with the other stories, I hope it will become clearer to you. So we're still in this together. Um, we have a lot to say about this story. I, I hope you like it. I'm excited to get into this one with you. So uh, I will see you next time. Uh, stay healthy. Um, keep doing what you're doing. You're doing a great job. And I will talk to you very soon. Bye, 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 bye.